We want to be mindful about how do we make the most amount of money in the least amount of time. The relative strength between the winners and the losers increases. That means that our basket shows that the leaders continue to outperform and continue to outperform. What we really try to do is concentrate on the pre-existing conditions that may lead to a trend day. Relationships. That's so essential for good trading. What is price doing relative to an indicator? What is price doing relative to a certain market environment? And you know you're gonna get closer to a top when they start scraping the bottom of the barrel to look for the dogs that haven't moved. Never get caught into averaging. Never, never, never. That's my golden rule. Don't trade too small because you'll be ridiculously sloppy and, and don't trade too big because you'll just make unforced errors. <laughs>
just in general, this is a general commentary because most people, when they think of relative strength, rightly so, it refers to momentum trading and investing where a stock outperforms a benchmark. Now we can do the same thing with commodities and commodity indices and see what's outperforming the relative strength. And we can use any benchmark. I use the S&P 500, but if you wanted to use the NASDAQ or the NYSE, you can play around with different ones. They'll all pretty much come up with a similar group of the leaders and the laggards, okay? And the thesis behind relative strength is that in a momentum type of environment, which is going to be um, generated by a positive feedback type of system, which we'll look at, the trend is going to outperform. And in positive feedback and momentum, that is what generates a trend, okay? So in a nice uptrending bull market, making new highs, you are going to have good positive feedback and obviously a trend. And you can see the type of environment that we have been in for the last a year and a half, exception of just a few stocks, it's been fairly flat sideways market. And so we'll look at some of the uh, little traps in that type of environment. So it's not only dependent on the market, on the look back period, but the market environment. And it's most useful in a strong market. It exhibits the characteristics of positive feedback. So we can have this positive feedback phenomena in a downtrending market as well. Okay, so um, obviously a contrarian strategy in the trading range would be where the laggards are bought at the bottom of the range and then outperform the leaders, um, which is something that most people don't consider these types of environments because we have been in such a steady, strong bull market, which has been coming to an end. So we need to sort of adjust our thinking for strategies going forward. Um, for really aggressive short duration stock traders, and this is not my style, but I see it amongst some friends, and um, most of them are very short term duration. They could even be just day traders with the use of weekly options and daily options. You can really capitalize on some of these things. But I'm sure you guys are familiar with these strategies looking for what is the largest percent gap up on the opening, the largest five minute bar off the opening. Perhaps you could incorporate a volume component in there, the largest 15 minute gain from the previous day's higher close in terms of a percentage wise. And so these strategies have become so well known and everybody scours them in the pre-market that you have to be very nimble and uh, not shy about pulling that trigger pretty quickly. And so uh, also being quick to exit if you are in a non-follow through market, because you'll see that all the trend will peter out at the end of the Europe and Europe close. And you have to be really mindful if you are using options as one of your trading vehicles. And I'm sure all of you have experienced that, that trade uh, these little hot potato options. So we're all, I'm going to spend more time on looking back with a longer duration. We're not going to concentrate on all these short term tricks um, because I think that so many of you are familiar with them. I want to bring something new to the table just by introducing some of Gary Anderson's work. Okay. Um, the reviews. Okay. This is difference between the main thesis of Gary Anderson is the difference between the positive environment feedback loops and the momentum is calculated by the spread between the basket of leaders and a basket of laggards. And I will show you exactly how to do that. So for example, we have been in a downtrending momentum environment. I know it sounds like a mouthful in an uptrend, okay, but what's what's happened is that the um, spread between the leaders and the laggards has been converging because of this type of environment. So normally we would be in a contrarian type of mode looking to buy the shares just coming off of bases at the lower end of the trading range. 
And a perfect example of this is on Friday when we actually saw the laggards jump by 5.7%. I, I, and the leaders rose 0.6%. So we really need to figure out where are we going to get the most bang for our buck. I mean, on a day like Friday and the day before, you could practically throw darts at a dartboard and anything's going to go up. But we want to be mindful about how do we make the most amount of money in the least amount of time. And that's going to be your selection of markets to trade. Okay, so I'm going to go back to showing you at the lowest end of the range, a one day look back period. And I use TradeStation and you can see I have a nice grid here of three different relative strength look back periods and each of them serves a different purpose. So I have a longer term look back period of 120 days and then I have a middle column here, intermediate, and I'll explain exactly how I use that. And then of course, this is our uh, one day, and you can actually see this in the middle of the day very, very clearly. Um, uh, and uh, I think Caterpillar was one that just, boom, shot up to the top of the list on Friday. So I just wanna show you what that looks like because you can see here, I have a weekly chart and a daily chart. So any look back period with longer than three, four days of duration is not going to capture these things. So I like that one day look back period when we're just starting to see a move. And what we see here is a classic example of a laggard of sorts um, catching the bid and outperforming. And you can see Dish, Macy's, the Russell, uh, you know, Lulu, of course, was a unique situation, but Caterpillar. So these were all the shares that outperformed the S&Ps on Friday by a significant amount. And that's what we really want. Where are we going to get our, you know, our outperformance? So this column right here is our one day relative strength. And usually I, I use all three of them. When I look at these at night, I'll just kind of sw scroll through all three of them. And maybe you don't want to buy the opening on Monday, but then we can put this on our watch list and that's a good way to go about doing it. So this was the slide I've, I just went over on uh, how Friday the laggards jumped significantly. And that is indeed signs of a trading range type of environment or negative feedback loops. And that is a counter trend. It puts a damper on some of the upside momentum functions. Not that we can't have a bull market. We could even go up and, and um, go and retest the high. We can even look above the high on the Dow, but it's just saying that as long as that spread between the laggards and the leaders is starting to converge, you are going to get more bang for your buck on those little dogs there. So the middle column that I showed you here, I'm gonna go back, I don't know why this is skipping over this stuff here. Okay, this middle column here, I have set to, um, I use the last cycle low. And so that is a, a uh, oscillator low <clears throat> on the S&Ps and that always gives a good definition of it. And so it was 21 days, just looking back, you can see the, the cycle in the NASDAQ and the S&Ps. And so this is just sort of interesting. You don't want to necessarily buy this on day 21, but if you can identify a little cycle low here and start to do the scan on day three and day four and day five, um, those are the nice little hot potatoes that can give us much more than we're expecting. And you can see as well, we're in that environment that's not a momentum-based environment where most of these shares, NVIDIA of course has been hot to trot here, but most of these shares have been underperforming with a longer look back period. Maybe 80% uh, maybe, uh, of these have been underperforming. So that's one thing that we can do with that middle column, set the look back period to the start of the cycle low on an index. Another trick I really like is to look at the start of the quarter. 
And sometimes if I, if I do it three days out, four days out, just a little week period there at the start of the quarter, what you will see, it's going to pick up all the stocks that have the best institutional participation behind them. And institutions are slow moving dinosaurs for the most part, and they tend to adjust their strategies quarter by quarter by quarter. So if you see things outperforming the first week of a new quarter, it tends to outperform for the quarter. So it's just a little caveat there. Um, and let's see here. This here is our traditional six month look back period. So when you're looking for investment candidates, in general, it's not 100%, but the shares that have been outperforming for the previous six months tend to continue to outperform. So GE has been on my radar because it was actually outperforming in February and March. You know, if you had bought any time in this time period and stuck it in your portfolio, it still made new highs there on Friday. So that's kind of a longer term duration thing. Uh, great for your IRA or a, a separate holding account just to establish a little bit of a presence. It may not generate the most beta but um, or alpha, you know, but it's steady. And so it has lower drawdowns in general. So let's just talk about this Janus here as a market metaphor because Janus was the Roman god of gates and doors, represented by two opposing faces. And this represents the duality of things, the one-sided, two-sided nature of things. You know, coin has two sides. The metaphor of Janus explains the dual nature of the markets and how the markets vacillate between these two different environments. Although one wouldn't think so the previous 10 years, but um, one is determined by the trend followers and the other has been the contrarian bargain hunters. The trend followers have not been doing so swank uh, this year. And uh, I think some of the bargain hunters have caught a few gems. That's just my opinion. So I don't have any way of knowing for sure. I never know for sure who is doing what. And I see so many people fall into the trap of, oh, they're going for the stops or, oh, it's the algos or, oh, do, 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 kind of forcing a little bit of um, story to the thing. And I just find that that does not serve me and I've not really seen it ever serve anybody else. So always remember there's two sides to a coin. But when we want to... Um, Let's see, put this into the positive feedback, the positive feedbacks, the momentum and the acceleration. And yes, no doubt we did see that in NVIDIA, but NVIDIA does not make the whole market either. Okay, so we are going to look at how we use a basket of the top 10% of shares in our database and the bottom 10% of shares in our database and keep our database fairly small, two to 300 shares, and then we're gonna take the spread between those. So NVIDIA, of course, would be a contributing factor, but uh, we'll see surprisingly how many of the laggards at the bottom range have been coming to life one by one. So when there is positive feedback, what tends to happen is the relative strength between the winners and the losers increases. That means that our basket shows that the leaders continue to outperform and continue to outperform. And you know you're gonna get closer to a top when they start scraping the bottom of the barrel to look for the dogs that haven't moved, which is still a mistake. Whoops, but I'm going to just go back here. And by the way, all my slides will be available for you. So if you wanna go back and review something, not a problem. Um, so the direction of the momentum can be up or down. That's the widening of that spread. And we see the same thing to the downside where these laggards get hit so much further than the leaders. So that spread widens once again. 
when that spread starts to converge, and we've actually seen that for the last, uh, you know, 16 months, that represents a form of rotation, which is most likely in a trading range. All right. Uh, but the increasing momentum is really what drives the trend. Sorry about that. I've got a little twitchy mouse here. Uh, I thought I had to feed him some cheese. Okay. So yes, when the spread is decreasing, there's rotation. When it's increasing, you've got upside uh, trend or downside trend. Um, so there is the there's the gist of it. And uh, again, when there is positive feedback, the direction of the momentum, which is the periods that are moving the market. So for example, in 2022, um, we saw a directional bias to the downside, obviously, but there were periods of positive feedback during that period. So let's be mindful about that. So now we're going to look at how Gary calculates his relative strength spread. And I think it's a genius idea. And of course, everybody can do their own variations on this. And that's the whole point. If you hear somebody in this conference suggest an idea, you can take that same idea and say, well, can I express it this way? Can I quantify it that way? I'll show you another way that I quantify it. But it's really, you know, don't take any of this as gospel. Play around with it and make it your own. So to find out whether the relative strength environment is working, first we're going to identify the strongest and the weakest stocks as a day D. And then the changes in each set, the changes in the leaders and the changes in the laggards are averaged. And then they're recorded for the following day or D plus one. So forward changes for each set are accumulated. And then the specific stocks that rank among the strongest and weakest may vary daily, but you'll find it doesn't matter when you're looking at a basket of 20 to 30 stocks. So this method provides a continuous updating of the forward performance of the relative strength leaders and laggards. And you can do this just once a week. It's not something that you have to do every single night because the look back periods that we're going to use are, um, you can see here, the relative strength limited at the top 10%. We're going to use a five month look back period for the laggards. So that does not change as often and a three week look back period for the leaders. So uh, you want to update the, the, this on a weekly basis because these changes can happen quickly. Gary, by the way, puts out a newsletter and I'll give you all the information for that. And it only comes out once a month and his client base is institutional, mutual funds, you know, hedge funds, uh, that type of group. So you don't want to be making decisions when you're running, you know, half a billion dollars, you know, on too short of a time frame. So that's sort of his wheelhouse there. But let me just give you some food for thought here. Okay, there we go. This is an example of negative feedback environment, meaning mean reversion. And everybody is familiar with Jesse Livermore's name, along with uh, some of the others. Levy Rich, um, was a, a pioneer with relative strength. So the 1930s experienced significant mean reversion. There was no uptrend to the, to the um, spread. And uh, this was a period driven by negative feedback and risk adverse contrarian traders. I can't imagine why after the 20s. <laughs> but during those years, there were five separate months where a trend following strategy would have lost over 40%. So that's pretty harsh. Each instant came as the market rose substantially trapping Jesse Livermore, and he was forced to declare bankruptcy yet again. Not that he wasn't a very savvy trader, but he was essentially a one trick pony, which is going to bring us at the end to why we need to adjust our strategies in certain environments. So you, there's very few single methods or strategies that we can apply 
through all these varying conditions. So always be aware of that. You know, right when they find the key, it stops working, right? The key to the lock. So this was the period you can see here in the 1930s and even into the 40s where there was no uptrend, there was no downtrend. It was a very flat period. It was a mean reverting period. Sell the rallies, buy the dips, you know, buy the dips, sell the rallies, right when you think there's gonna be a breakout, it's a trap, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be an example of a chart. And I used monthly data just because I wanted to compress that time period that Jesse Livermore got caught in. Now, this is a chart courtesy of Gary Anderson. And what we see is a little bit ironic. It's kind of a paradox because since the start of 2022, momentum has been declining. And I'm sure some of you felt this, you know, a month or two months ago with the contraction in the daily ranges. I always calculate the dollar value for the daily ranges on the futures that I trade. And it's just, it's just been going down, down, down. If you were to plot a chart of the average true range, probably because some of the money uh, liquidity has been, uh, you know, tempered a little bit by the Fed. But this is sort of interesting because you can see we have this continual downtrend, which is a little bit deceptive because you think there was a downtrend in the market but it was not a momentum decline, even though I'm sure it felt like that if you were getting long prematurely. So I thought that was interesting of note. We have seen these trends in the direction of momentum persist for multiple years at a time. So it does not mean that everything has to come to life. And right now we are in that contrarian negative feedback type of loop. Um, so what we want to do is buy at the lower end of the trading range and sell at the upper end of the range. And I'm not saying step in front of something like look like a NVIDIA, but I am saying that as you can see on Friday's action, uh, some of these little um, laggards just grossly outperformed the leaders. And uh, so just be aware of that. Um, as a contrarian, and I'm a better contrarian trader than I am a momentum trader, frankly, because that's just how I started off on the trading floor. And it was very difficult to be on a trading floor and buy breakouts. So that is not my forte. But we'll always be looking for the sold out issues and that are ready to turn. And this, this does not mean like dog dogs that, you know, were uh, high risers for the pandemic and then just crashed and burned and they're still up in flames. Um, but, you know, contrarian, you're looking at some of these oversold Dow shares that we saw. They're good shares, uh, but they were just sold out. And, um, you know, uh, they uh, we, we want to buy them before they pop, not like after they pop on Friday, but you should see that they should get some continuation in the trend here. And uh, I think that there's a chance that they can make back 50% of their downtrend, which would pull more money in because most of you know, with the sentiment readings, it's been way, way, way too bearish for way, way, way too long. So we have to figure out how uh, the market's going to pull in some of this money. And I think that they feel safer buying these uh, contrarian types of shares. Oh, golly jeepers. Okay, so I'm just going to give you some quick resources before moving on. This is Gary Anderson's book, The Janus Factor, Trend Followers Guide to Market Dialectics. And it was written in 2012. And I find everything more relevant than ever. Um, Equity PM is his newsletter, and I think it's fairly reasonably priced. At any rate, you can go to his website, Gary at equitypm.com. I want more people to be aware of his work and his research because it is so unique. It's so unique that it was recognized as getting the Charles Dow Award, which is a very prestigious paper. And um, I have not seen hardly anything else written about this, but I do feel if you read his book, it will fill in a missing gap 
or whole in your knowledge because we tend to be very linear based in our approach to the markets these days. Um, and by that, I mean not using as much context as we should. So I think he'll just highlight that awareness. And if you are a student of relative strength, the number one book you really want to look at is <clears throat> Robert Levy's book, The Relative Strength Concept of Common Stock Price Forecasting. So this is a classic and should be in every technician's library. And if you're a trader, and I know that most of you trade stocks, uh, and um, so I think this would be a valuable addition for you to pick up. As an aside, since I've quoted Gary multiple times, he is a Wyckoff aficionado. Wyckoff adds a lot of structure to the market as well. And he has been in the markets for 45 years. He's been a principal of Anderson and Lowe, which he formed in 1990. And his advising services are um, subscribed to by a very international clientele. So he's got a lot of credentials and credibility there. So moving on now, I am going to show you some other ways that I have always viewed this positive feedback and this negative feedback, especially since I was originally coming from, even though I started on the options floor doing stocks, uh, 10 years later, I gravitated to doing mostly futures. Most of the things I talk about, I have to consider true principles of price behavior, meaning that they will work on stocks equally as well as futures, but you all know they have their own unique little subtle nuances, especially when it comes down to noise. And most stocks tend to be much noisier than futures. So this is a little thing down here that I plotted for you. And actually I put this in the, in the uh, book, that Trading Sardines book that I did as an example of what I did in, you guys are gonna laugh. It was in the late uh, 1980s and the early 1990s. And at that time in the late 1980s, the OEX options were the thing to trade. They were very hot, they were liquid, um, you know, this was of course uh, in the good old days. And um, what I would do is down here at the bottom, you can see I've got assorted rates of change. A three, a four, a five, a six, a seven period, a nine period. You can play with this and throw in whatever you want. And you'll see that we have periods right here where all the rates of change pull on up. That's your positive feedback mode. And that's what's giving it go, go, go. Typically after the positive feedback mode has ended, you'll see this fragmentation here between all the different rates of change. The longer term ones are still going up but the ones that are shorter have fallen. And at this point right here, when this spread is the widest, that's when I would short straddles on the OEX because it needs to consolidate. And then you can see typically what happens, we wound down in this green here. This is a, hard to see green, but it's an equilibrium point. So this is typically the market's process. Everybody tends to think of the best buying opportunities uh, coming from oversold or overbought conditions. And that's not always so. A lot of times we have to wind down to these equilibrium points. And if you are a student of market profile, you will understand exactly what I'm talking about by developing a high volume node or this um, balance. I think Jim Dalton calls it a balance period. So in, in that balance period right in here, we're starting to get our price bar overlap. It tends to take three bars uh, before you can say that a trend has come into balance and then it's susceptible to either continuation or reversal. But we can say that the trend has ended and come into balance down here at which point in this case, you can see we had a whole new positive 
feedback loop starting to the upside. And then of course up here, it had to consolidate and do choppy, choppy. So, so easy in hindsight, right? You know? Okay, but it doesn't always work that way real time, especially when you look at it on your particular market. I just want you to see this process. It's a continuous process, positive feedback, consolidation, wind down to that equilibrium point, and it does tend to work on most markets. Now, this is a mini cycle of what we were talking about with Gary's work, but it's still utilizing the same concepts of different environments where different strategies work. Here we're in our counter trend mode, just because this is so fragmented, you know, you can uh, buy dips, sell rallies, buy dips, sell rallies, or short premium. This is a great environment that I like for shorting premium. And I just make sure I take it back as these start to consolidate, because then you're gonna be ready for another rock and roll type of session. And so now I'm going to introduce one more thing because this is my favorite tool that I use in trading futures. And we will see that it does work on stocks. Here were our little squiggly lines. I swear you can never throw enough squiggly lines up on the charts and it's bound to, you can see whatever you wanna see in it. But down here at the bottom in this green line, I have the two period rate of change, which is my main trading tool because it is slightly better signal to noise rate ratio than a one day rate of change. Okay, so it just cleans out a little bit of the noise, even though momentum, just so you know, is the noisiest indicator you can use. It's really a lot like reading tea leaves. So uh, this here is a 310 oscillator, the difference between a three period and a 10 period, simple moving average, with a 16 period smoothing line. So we're smoothing the momentum here. You can easily use a stochastic. You could use a seven period stochastic with a percent like D three or four and a 12 to 16 period, um, you know, slow line on the stochastic. So uh, multiple ways to skin a cat. The most important variables in this model tend to be the trend of this slow line representing the trend of the momentum, very analogous to price being above that 20 period EMA, and then the positive slope in the two period rate of change. So we have all three slopes in the same direction. It's pretty rare that you get more than two, maybe three back to back days of positive feedback most positive feedback when I'm trading these futures for my purposes, my holding time tends to be two and a half days. And then we might have a little reaction back and you can load the boat again if you feel so inspired. So you'll also notice that when we're in this positive feedback mode, for the most part, it's going to lead to a trend day, a range expansion day, very important because as a trader, you know, it's a burnout job after a while. <laughs> and you don't want to be trading little every wiggle and jiggle and so forth. So what I really try to do is concentrate on the pre-existing conditions that may lead to a trend day. And what you'll what you'll see is when the market's in a consolidation as it is here, I look at these PF3s down, you see the negative slopes here in all three of these things. The market is giving it everything it's got to the downside. Hello, doggy. <laughs> My dogs wanna join the party, okay. It's giving it everything it's got to the downside and it's not leading to any range expansion. The ball is entirely in the bear's hands and they're fumbling it. You had a little bit of a dinky trap, look below that previous low and then right back up. So uh, that's my interpretation of it. And the best thing I could suggest to you, if you are interested in pursuing this, is to do your own work and study. I print out 
20 charts of each futures market at the end of the year and just review the different patterns and the setups that led to the upside breakouts or downside. And it's just an exercise for me. Now, uh, with the uh, 10 year notes here, slightly bit of a different environment, but this is back in uh, a few months ago. I want you to see that, um, again, this huge range expansion up, those are the trend bars up and that's where you get your positive feedback. And it's really rare, once again, that you get two or three days back to back of positive feedback. So after I saw this one, two, I'd be looking to buy. I buy up, oh, the market's not giving me much. Okay, I'll get out after a day or two. You know, okay, positive feedback to the downside. You can catch something for two or three days. You know, the whole point in trading is we don't have to be perfect on our entries or our exits. All we need to do is to get the main idea right and we far overcomplicate things. I do my best work just off of daily candle charts and of course I'll look at the short term uh, intraday time frames after the market opens you know and that's where I've always felt that that market profile work understanding the six or seven basic types of days is it going to be a double distribution day? Is it a little neutral day? Is it a, you know, all of these types of concepts really serve you if you're a professional trader. You don't have to trade by them, but just being aware of these different day types in context with maybe one or two little other indicators. So here I wanted to show you something really fun. This is another tool that I use. God bless TradeStation because now everybody can have their radar scan functionality for free. Huh? How many times do you get something for free? They used to charge 90 bucks a month, but now it's free. So I have a scan and you might want to try this out where it says, show me the new momentum highs with a 30 day look back period. So it will catch things like this just coming to life, okay? The momentum precedes the price, and then you see our PF3s up are giving a steady trend, and our, our bear's attempt to flush down is not. Now, I want to point out one thing. This is indicative of a long liquidation flush. We don't have lower lows, like beyond any of these lows, it's just a gentle, soft correction. So don't get caught up in that trap. Again, this is putting momentum in a different type of context now of what is the market structure? Are we in an uptrending structure? Sometimes you can get these one or two day washouts, these flushes to the downside and they're little traps. But if I see it coming out of this nice uh, consolidation structure and it makes a new momentum high, I am all uh, over that. And a lot of times you can just buy call spreads or however you want to trade it. And then we made yet another new momentum highs. Don't get trapped in looking at the divergences with these things in most cases, unless you're in a trading range. Now, what do we see again? Look, at, it's trying to force itself to the downside and where is this little sucker now? I can, I've got TradeStation on one side and I've got CQG on the other side. It's really for the redundancy, but um, okay. So now, ha 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 ha, look at this, look at this. Here is your positive consolidation because the bears are giving it everything they have to the downside here. You can see this oscillator is correcting all of the, the fast and slow line on my 310 oscillator. A stochastic would be correcting and it's not getting anywhere. This is such a strong signal. So a lot of our processing as traders is relationships. That's so essential for good trading. What is price doing relative to an indicator? What is price doing relative to a certain market environment? 
So I just looked out of the corner of my eye and General Electric is pushing 106. But you wouldn't necessarily see that in advance. That's the whole funny thing about the markets. You can't look around the corner and predict, but we can say, this is not a top, this is not distribution, this is a consolidation with higher lows and higher highs, and this is just going to explode again to the upside. So as you gain an experience, okay, you can better look at these relationships, you know, one price relative to an indicator, one price relative to the price at the start of the year, all of these types of relationships, I think, are way underestimated in their value. Okay, I wanna show you something else for fun since we're on my little wheelhouse here. This is um, using the slope of the three, four, five, six rate of change. And I do believe I put all these squiggly charts. This is, this little indicator right here is just a three, four, five, six period rate of change. And if you want to be really clever, you can calculate out the pivot at which point it will flip. I just see it. I, I put my, um, arrows so that they pop up in the middle of the day, not necessarily the close of the day, so I have time to evaluate it. So here you can see the little arrows is when they were all flipping down, all flipping up, and we can use some useful tools like only do the buy signals in the direction of the trend or only do the sell signals, but you can see some of these little buys generated some interesting uh, short-term swing trades. And so um, that was uh, so much fun with that. Now, unfortunately, you cannot trade everything. So you have to settle on, you know, are you going to do the futures? Are you going to have a basket of 20 stocks? Are you going to concentrate on one strategy across 200 stocks? And this is everybody's personal journey in the markets. So here I've got NVIDIA because it was one of the stronger ones. And you can see the little down arrows maybe led to one or two days follow through. Not very satisfying at all. But if you bought every little flip up in the momentum in this uptrending market, it did not catch it here. Instead, it gapped way up there. But that's just part of the game, right, guys? <laughs> it never does exactly what we want it to do, but it still worked. And then I want to show you the flip side of the coin with the same arrows and the same little rates of change. And now we're back into our trading range where we have the negative feedback. And I just want you to note how many false signals you would have had or how whipsawed you might have had, felt if you bought and it didn't have follow through and you sold and it didn't really have follow through and you bought and it didn't go and you sold and it didn't go and you bought and it didn't go. You guys get the picture here? So this is, and then of course, one stomping bad signal at the end. This is why I think was it uh, Jesse Livermore made a quote about staying out of these flat, narrow range sideways markets. Okay, obviously he preferred the trend a momentum type of plays, but you can just see the entirely different range than what I sold before. So it's it's a part common sense, you know. And another thing uh, that Jesse Livermore said was, even though he went bankrupt three times, he did a lot of fabulous market analysis and quotes and observation. And he said, um, don't try and basically guess the breakout. You know, let the market come to life. Don't go in and pick the direction at this point. It's a useless exercise. And so sometimes we can say, um, how can we save our resources? How can we avoid taking marginal signals? That's a very big part of the game because we only have limited energy. And so we really need to be careful about narrowing these things down. So, um, I put together a little slide of common pitfalls for traders. Hey, see that? Okay, that was Richard's suggestion. Um, it's hard for even me, um, <laughs> I'm well seasoned to escape cognitive biases. It just happens. And there's 
so many different types of cognitive biases, recency biases, you know, just getting influenced by somebody else's, everything under the sun. And um, that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Be aware of yourself. How easy are you to flip on a market to trading to the long side when it's in called for or trading from the short side? I know so many people that cannot trade gold from the short side, okay? So, you know, we all have our little uh, fond, you know, pets and so forth, but you really need to um, get rid of those cognitive biases. So when you're trying out something new, just such as some of the things that I'm talking about, always observe the results on a walk forward basis because our eyes tend to go selectively to the things that worked. And you'll find if you program this stuff, it picks up a lot more noise than you would have thought. So your only thing is to try it out on a walk forward basis, even if it's just for two to three weeks, and then examine the con with a real conscious effort all the times that the strategy failed. Some of my best observations that come from looking at failed signals and what were the conditions in those failed signals. So that's a, a, probably the most useful tip I can give. Self-discipline cannot be programmed. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that traders like to do is get ahead of the data. Try to see too many swings uh, in advance, especially in fast paced markets. And, and we just end up seeing what we want to see and projecting what we would like to have happen. So again, try and stay in the moment, try and live one data point to one data point. Even if you have a long-term swing trade that you're in, you're always monitoring for signs of the loss of momentum or should we tighten up our stop at some point. So don't try to see too far ahead um, because that's not going to serve you. And then lastly, sorry about that, do your own work, okay? Such a, such a strong statement because, you know, we all have different levels of experience and uh, some things may work for me only because I've jotted down the data for so many years. Other things might work for other people. Some people are breakout traders, some people counter trend traders. Um, so do your own work <clears throat> because if I am looking at something and I have it in my trading homework the night before, I have a certain expectation as to how that market should behave if it's going to do what I'm thinking it can do. And I'm very focused on trying to capture a trend day. So at this point, I'm pretty good at figuring out just two or three hours into the morning that it's not going to be a trend day. All the pre-existing conditions were there, but the volume didn't come in. The groups are too, uh, you know, segmented, half up, half down. Uh, the breadth is too flat. It's not going to be a trend day. And we didn't see that urgency of supply demand in that first half hour, because those imbalances are what really create a trend day. But you're not gonna get that same feel or knowledge if I'm just sending out a sheet to you and all of these could be trend days and then you look at them and you put something on, oh, it didn't work that time. You're not going to know it and you'll, you'll just end up uh, getting stopped out more often than you would wish. So do your own work, come up with your own thing. I think that's one of the um, learning curves that newer traders underestimate is that they don't give a strategy enough time and they don't give it enough time to try different hats on. Are you gonna be a breakout trader? Are you gonna be a momentum trader? Do you like this short-term relative strength work? And it just takes much longer than anybody thinks. I had a friend who, um, you know, he had sold his um, engineering firm. This is like many decades ago. He's long past, but he would, his, his cousin was the largest trader in the gold pit at the time. So he was always uh, very enthralled with the markets. And he would 
subscribe to a strategy, like for example, Steve Moore's seasonals or a volatility breakout system or this style, and he would give it three months, you know, to really evaluate it. Ultimately, he settled on day trading the S&Ps. And he was the one in that Street Smarts book that came up with the three little Indians uh, pattern, which is just three pushes at the end of a swing. But it took him a long time to arrive at that. Once he feels comfortable with that, that's all he did. And that's where you really start to make the money is being consistent. So a consistent process for your nightly preparation, it will keep you from getting too impulsive the next day and you are the least biased if you do your homework after the markets are closed, all right? So be conscious about these types of things. So just to summarize, because we do want to have some time for questions here, and I told Gary I would keep this, or I told Richard I would keep this under an hour. So there's many ways to use relative strength, but for short-term trades, as well as swing trades and portfolio positions, you can greatly improve your results by finding a process that helps quantify that market environment or just uh, pure observation, studying examples in the past. Gary Anderson showed us the way that he prefers to do it in his book with the relative strength leaders and laggards and the spread. But there's multiple ways that you can quantify the level of noise in the market environment. Um, Gartley is another classic technician that you should all study if you like the technicals because he contributed a lot with volume, but he was one of the first to pioneer relative strength work. But he abandoned all his work in the 1930s and 40s because it stopped working. Remember that flat period there where Jesse Livermore went broke? It was almost two decades where it just fell on its face. But on the other hand, Robert Levy, the other fellow that you should definitely get his book said, the historically strongest stocks produce the best future results and the weakest stocks preferred the worst. And he was looking at the 1960s. So take all that to heart and I've got plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Yeah, great, Linda. Thank you so much for, for putting that together. Uh, some extremely important points that I'm sure everybody watching got some great takeaways. Um, we'll go ahead and start with the q and I've got some questions to kick things off. Uh, but if anybody watching has some questions for Linda, this is the perfect time uh, to drop them in the chat. I already see a few coming in here, uh, so we'll get to those in just a second. Uh, but first, uh, see the chat? <laughs> uh, if you go to the URL, you can, um, if you'd like to. No, that's okay. I'll rely on you. All right. All right. Cool. Um, to kick things off, um, to your point of doing your work, and also I, I liked your uh, your bit about you know each year you print out a chart of of all all the markets and really study it. Could you could you talk about um, or, or give any advice to traders who want to do that type of work, study a process? Uh, do you have any advice for? Uh, I guess, having better deliberate practice in that sense and getting the most out of that and applying it to their training. So interestingly, when I was a member of the MTA, I went to their annual conference, which was in Santa Barbara at the time, very nice place to be, and heard a very powerful speech by uh, Frank Huden, that Frank, excuse me, Hank Pruden. See, this is what happens when I talk too long. Hank Pruden was probably the world's top Wyckoff aficionado. And his topic was doing your own work. Uh, you know, you are your best own best client. And you'll do your own work with closed doors and closed windows. In other words, isolated from all other opinions and distractions. And then later I found out that this was put out first by Wyckoff, okay? That you need to do your own work free of all other input and distractions and um, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is I have logged numbers for ages. Uh, I, I had to stop about 10 years ago because I was getting a, a problem with my joint in my thumb. But since you can see my slide up, I'll show you what I was doing by hand, probably for a good solid 30 years and uh, Let's see, I can just, this is pretty cool being on Zoom. I can just slide this over, assuming it comes up here. Excel not responding. Okay. 
Yeah, right so now, this, right now I still see. Oh, there it is. There it is. It just came yeah, up. Yeah, popped up. So this is an Excel spreadsheet, and I use a DLL link to extract the data from CQG. So you can do this with TradeStation. Several different software products, you know, suck the data out and then put it into someplace else. So I would essentially write down, let me get the S&Ps up here, write down the closing price. This is the two period rate of change, the most important variable for me. Uh, this was the pinball cell column. We don't need that 5SMA thing there. And we don't need that oscillator thing. This is just the closes above or below the 5SMA. So you can see right now the S&Ps have had five closes above the five SMA. We can see this momentum reading of plus 100 is greater than all these other previous readings till we get down here. Um, you can also see that, uh, you know, there's several little subtle patterns here, these two PF3s up that I was talking about where you gave it everything you could to the upside. We closed at 4215. And then we had to consolidate for two days, actually three, four, five, six, seven, before we caught a bit again. So I used to do this for probably 25 markets every day. And now you can see, I just have it all in an Excel spreadsheet. But what I did then was to consolidate this all onto one sheet here. So I can just print out this is just because we haven't started trading it um, in these two markets, the Boons and the DAX. So I'll open up a little bit later. Same with the grains. So I could put them all on one window. But just to let you know, I would write down every single one of these by hand. And so I had to uh, get creative here and uh, find another way to do that. The best way I look this is after I've logged all my numbers, which could take a 25 minutes, and it's brunt. I hate doing it, I really do. It's like my least favorite part of my job. But there is something where you write down with pencil that goes to the brain and you remember it, as opposed to just looking at some spreadsheet like this. So what I also do is I print out charts that are just daily charts, daily candlestick charts, and then I'll just make a little notation on the chart, and then that takes the replacement of this. So that was just one creative way of writing down this data. Now you certainly do not have to do so many markets. You could certainly just write down the S&P index, and that is what I did for the very first uh, year that I started <coughs> logging these numbers. And where I got the idea was from Taylor Trading Technique, my all-time favorite book. And you can go in there, and I do not understand his little squiggles and gyrations and how the hell he was calculating these things. They make no sense to me. But it was his way of seeing things at a time where they didn't have charts, they didn't have computers, and he was just trying to keep some rhythm there. So I never went to his method of his little weird, you know, the difference between the high and the previous day's low, but I did start writing down these things. And in the back of that George Douglas Taylor trading technique was a brief article by, um, oh shoot, can't remember his name right now. I always believe in giving everybody credit. My book right here somewhere. I usually have five dozen copies around the office, but uh, that's okay. Oh, George Angel, George Angel, that was it. And so he started talking about the two period rate of change and he had his little metrics for, uh, I don't know, monitoring if it was a you know big high to low day or so forth and so forth. So that's where I just fell into the habit of doing this and um, yeah, I, th I think it really works, you know, writing stuff down by hand. So you can pick anything. I just picked the S&Ps and I used to write down the open, high, low, close, <laughs> probably overkill, open, high, low, close, two period rate of change. And, and I'd also put like a little circle if it was what I call a three bar triangle or three price bars of overlap, because then 
the trend has come into balance and I found that I can't predict the outcome at those points. You can't predict if it's going to go down or you can't predict if it's going to go up, but you do know if it starts trading above that first hour's range or below that first hour's range, you just wanna be on board and you can just enter at the market and half the time um, it really needs to keep going. You can pretty much pull your stop down to even, a break even after three hours if it's working and if it's not working, you know, you just scratch it or take a small nick. And it actually works fairly well in stocks if you go back and study that. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, to calculate the two-day rate of change, is it the um, is it as, as simple as the close divided by the close two days ago, and then the the percent change? Not divided that? by. It's taking That's today's right. close minus the close two days ago. Gotcha. And gotcha. you'll see on most software programs, it's labeled either rate of change or momentum. They're essentially the same thing. Yeah, perfect. That's helpful. Um, are there any other uh, parts of that indicator that you find people get confused about when it comes to calculating it, the the oscillator that you fabricated that uh, I'm sure a lot of people might want to investigate that and, and see if it works for them. Um, so any, any advice? Oscillator? Yeah, yeah. So interestingly, I did not create that. Um, that came from a company called Security Market Research. And uh, oh my goodness, so many traders used to subscribe to that back in the uh, good old days. Um, you know, Larry Williams, uh, who's the uh, very vocal guy that um, Pitbull wrote Pitbull. Marty Schwartz, so, yeah. Marty Schwartz, yeah. So that's what we used back in those days. And they would overnight us the new set of charts um, each weekend. And then during the day, we could update them and you could get the plot. You call on the telephone, just like you would for a hotline. And you had a little worksheet and it would read off the numerical values for each of those. But what they did is they normalized it in slightly different ways so that you wouldn't ever have a zero thing. And mm -hmm. so that the values were never the same as on the charts. And then I just figured it out. Like, this is just the difference of a three and 10 period, simple moving average. But it took me like 10 years to figure that out. <laughs> they had had a good one on me. Um, you really, oscillators are just based on the price. So I can create a stochastic that looks near identical to the 310 oscillator. The 310 has a little bit more definition because it's not a banded oscillator like the stochastic. Everybody finds their own little tool, you know, and you only need one. Yeah, perfect. And uh, there's a good question from Ro Roberto Wilco, and I actually had the same question here. Uh, Linda, how has your trading changed over the years uh, and are you using the same techniques and strategies or have you adapted to different markets? Um. Well, two things, you know, when I had my hedge fund, I had uh, the opportunity to do a lot more strategies. I had two assistants, I had somebody doing my execution, so I could trade a lot more markets. If I tried to do that by myself, I will, I will so get into trouble. <laughs> um, I'm not a very good stock trader short term. I mean, it just is a distraction for me. So I really concentrate on the futures. That's my bread and butter and mm -hmm. where I get the most bang for the buck. I would say that um, in terms of what's changed, very little with my original strategies. I was so influenced by that, you know, in one day, out the next day style that uh, volatility breakout players like, you know, Larry Williams or Toby Craybell or these types of uh, people, they were so popular in the 1980s. And, um, I think we were way ahead of the curve with the equity traders. Now the equity traders have caught on to quantifying things a lot more. I would say the biggest thing that's trading now is that I tend to put positions on at Asia opening, you know, so I might have a signal that says, wow, this next day is going to be a strong buying day, but I might come in the next morning and it might've already been well marked up in Asia and Europe. So then it's still a buy day, but, Sometimes you can short it first and catch a little down and then try buying the pullback. So um, the 24 hour phenomena did, uh, you know, make things more complicated. 
I just don't trade them if they've left me in the dust or I don't want to bother. So if you have enough setups, you know, each day by maybe that, I mean, maybe 10, you know, or 10 or 12 on your list and you capture two or three of them. I, I mean, for me, I'll get into trouble over trading and I'll get into trouble having too many positions on. So I've throttled things way back, you know, I'm supposed to be retired, but here I am in front of my screens every day and I, I closed my hedge fund down like, I don't know, eight years ago. So it's yeah, nice. Perfect. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. No uh, regulatory stuff. Mm -hmm. And my favorite question to, to ask traders um, is about their routines and, and kind of their prep work. Uh, so would you be willing to kind of walk through your day and kind of how you go about, you know, preparing for the trading day and, and all the way up to, you know, executing a trade? What's kind of your process there and what are, what's kind of the checklist that you run through each time? Well, at night I print off my sheets. So I have my trading sheets where uh, it's very, very simple. I'll just put, you know, buy day or breakout mode or exit, you know, if I have a position on. I mean, I really keep it down to two or three words. I find that my head, if I just write down too much and try to analyze too much, it all goes out the window. So just the simplest cue that I can take off. And then when the mark, I, I, I try to sit down at uh, 8 a.m. Eastern time. I'm always at my desk then because um, I used to trade the bonds real regularly and um, they'd have a time of day function because Euro, uh, Europeans would be going to lunch, you know, and there'd always be an inflection point uh, around that period, plus or minus 20 minutes. Same thing with gold, it would have an inflection point. And over time, these inflection points have changed a little bit. Now gold and silver can actually flush down in the first hour a lot more than they used to. Uh, but I, I have a chart that's like all the little five minute charts and I have a line that's plotted there as to the 8 a.m. opening. So I have not only the 8 a.m. Eastern time opening, but I also have a chart that shows all of these markets hit session data only. So you can see pretty quickly um, at 8 a.m. If I have a market that gaps up, even if it's the S&Ps or the NAS and Europe's not even open yet, and they do three bars up off of that opening price, that's very likelihood it's going to be a strong trend up. It's, it's so funny. I don't know what it is about those three five minute consecutive bars. And then likewise, um, if there's a gap, you know, does it retrace partly into the gap? And it's just all just everybody's so familiar with trading these gaps now. Does it hold or is it, you know, going to partially fill and then off to the races? So we learn a lot just from that. And I'll try to identify the, the, few markets that look like they're going to be the strongest off the opening price or, or the weakest. And again, this is 8 a.m. It doesn't matter that the NYSC isn't open. It really doesn't matter because I'll queue off the DAX. And mm -hmm. I find that the, the patterns in the DAX, you know, just stay true to the S&Ps, you know, the 5 and 30 and 120 minute if there's divergences or, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, um, you know, it's, uh, I, 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 I would try to sit and just, you know, watch and uh, usually if I saw a, a little flurry in activity or something that was in the direction of my bias, I just buy it at the market. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to move the size that I did when I have the, had the fund, you know, so I'm like, get the trade on. And um, lately the past year, I have been playing tennis in the middle of the day. There you go. So, you know, I don't get quite as leveraged as and and uh, trading as I I used to. So I've stepped back a bit. I'm supposed to be chilling, you know, but it's fun. You know, here's the problem: it is it is a really fun game, and uh, especially when you have your style and your strategy down, you know, and and you know, you, you know, you've got the tiger by the tail. But it does. It's um, even though I've been doing it all those years, it still takes an hour every evening for me to do my prep. And if I'm not going to do that hour prep in the evening, I'm uh, probably not going to trade much the next day. Yeah, I know great. myself by now, I'll start to get reactive. Yeah, yeah, perfect. 
Um, and, and looking back on your trading career, especially as you're kind of developing your strategy and your method, um, were there any kind of key turning points where your performance really you turned a corner? Um, you know, maybe it was a, a trade that kind of shifted things for you, uh, where you made a realization and any, any like stories or anything like that come to mind? Sure. Well, two key things, you know, I started off in the options pit. So I was first on, on the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange, and then I was on the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. And back in those days, you know, the market makers function, you're standing in the pit, and you're, you're forced to fill the paper, you know, the broker yep. comes in, you have to make a two sided market, you don't know if he's a buyer or seller, although generally you do. And, um, you know, so you have to make an offer and it's usually sometimes it's when the market's really going up you know so you have to figure out how to position yourself ahead of time long gamma to take advantage of that or be very good at hedging quickly with stock because it's not like there's two-sided uh paper like you would have in the futures you know the futures is constantly bid ask bid ask bid ask but we would have periods where the brokers would walk into the pit and all they want to do is sell the premiums because they're buy writers, you know, buy right, buy right. So everybody ends up choking on these same positions. And um, so therefore, my initial conditioning was very counter trend. And I, like everybody else, would get run over twice a month by a strong trend day, you know, mm -hmm. although I still made money well because it was a lucrative, uh, inefficient market at the time. But then when I started managing money, you cannot be that nimble when you're trading, you know, some size. And I, I thought, you know, I have to switch my thinking. I really have to do a reversal and figure how to be on the right side of a trend day and never get caught into averaging. Never, never, never. That's my golden rule. Um, and so one of the ways that helped me was just trading a canned volatility breakout system from a friend, Bob Uran. And you start to get a better sense of the statistics. Oh, I only need like 20% huge wins and everything else kind of washes out a little bit. Right. And you just have these gifts, you know, like four trading days a year could make your entire year. It was crazy. So I thought, ah, you know, I need to be mindful of this range expansion concept. So that was one uh, really good turning point and um hmm uh, i would say that was probably the most important thing figuring out how to capture a trend day instead of you know being the market maker upstairs thing which just does not work for me yeah perfect and with regards to learning more about risk management and kind of mastering that side of things were there any kind of big losses that impacted you uh in, in a large way or um how how did you go about learning risk management and learning its importance in your trading? Oh, I have to tell you, there were periods where I was absolutely the worst at risk management, you know, yeah. horror stories, you know, and I think I put some of them in that trading sardines book, you know, where I was short all this way out of the money uh, premium. And I don't know if it was the 10 year or the 30 year notes at the time. And this was at the, you know, time when the Fed was playing hanky panky with everything and, you know, I got caught in one of those little positive feedback cycles because everybody was short derivatives and the bonds are notorious for that. And I was over in Hong Kong and staying up all night. And it's just the, I don't know, somehow I managed to trade my way out of that and just scratch the whole thing. I have no idea how my first always thing, if I'm caught on something like that, just a a black swan or something that you can't see. And keep in mind, I, I could not put stops in because mm -hmm. I might have 600 contracts in a particular position and you can't use stops like that. You just have to have your levels where you're going to stop, you know, where you're gonna start getting smaller. Right. But I found that if I could take off part of the position right away, you know, um, then I could reinitiate it at a much better price. So that was one saving grace. And the other saving grace was that I really traded on fairly low leverage. I think people would be shocked at what low leverage I use, you know, one contract per hundred thousand, you know, dollars, that, that type of stuff. So that's always, I always had a unit size 
And um, I would say that most of my career as a fund manager, I never really had more than a, a 2% drawdown, you know, in one day, except for this time that I got caught where the S and P's gapped higher. And I had just put on a big short position that Friday, you know, and they came out and, you know, made some random freak announcement and the markets opened up 40 S and P's higher against me. And I think I was short a couple hundred S and P's and a couple Russell. And I'm like, ah, you know, yeah. but I, I ended up only really, you know, at, at its extreme, it, it was about a 4% loss, but it was a big dollar amount, <laughs> yeah. very big dollar amount. It was like $4 million, choop, mm. like opening up on Sunday night. But you know, what do you do? You get smaller to the point where you can trade again. And I think over time, every trader just starts to get desensitized to these things. And you just don't want to use big leverage if you are newer you know just yeah. stay small because i'll tell you one last story this is a really good one mm -hmm. um when i was at the philadelphia stock exchange jeff yas was there trading at the same time jeff went on to form susquehanna he's basically a billionaire because i think they sold out to swiss i don't know one of the other big biggies there and Jeff is super savvy he's probably the smartest guy I have ever seen in terms of processing data I, I've never seen anybody come close to Jeff Yoss and um, he was very astute poker player I mean he could mm -hmm. play in the championships in Las Vegas and he um, would always have his groups of traders play poker after the market closed and he would kind of supervise them, you know, to see how they're doing because he felt that was the best way to learn about risk management. Mm -hmm. And so um, he, uh, he said that if you bet too small, you're not going to play a good game. So if you're trading in the markets and you have an account size of $200,000, and you're trading one e-mini, okay, it's not going to mean anything. It's not going to hurt. You're not going to be as attentive to it, okay? So on the other hand, if you trade too big, now all of a sudden you've introduced this variable of fear. So you need to really think about what is proportional to your trading account in terms of your unit size. And you can do the same thing with stocks, you know, what's, what's your average line that you use and the price of the stock and so forth. And uh, I, I think that's really important for people to recognize. Don't trade too small because you'll be ridiculously sloppy. And, and don't trade too big because you'll just make uh, unforced errors. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Linda, this has been really great. I think I just have kind of one last question for you. Sure. Uh, you mentioned never averaging down is kind of a golden rule of yours. Uh, are there any other kind of uh, golden rules that you abide by that you think are really important for, for traders out there to hear? Oh man, I, I just like, if something doesn't feel comfortable it's starting to go against me, I love my flatten button. I am, I'm in debt to that flatten button, boom, flatten. It's like off my, you know, off my P&L off. I don't see the trade anymore. And then, like I said, if I really feel like I did that and a little bit of a selling into the hole, you know, I can always rebuy it back. So I, I love the flatten button. Yeah, perfect. Uh, well, Linda, thanks again for taking the time for putting this together and for joining us today and for answering all these questions. Uh, I really appreciate it. I think everybody watching uh, had a great time as well and took something away, as I can see from the chat. Um, where can people learn more uh, from you, your style? Uh, what, what other resources would you point everybody watching towards? Oh, my gosh. I have so many YouTube videos I've made out there, like long ones, 45 minutes, an hour yep. of webinars taped for free, you know, <laughs> it's all free. You don't even have to subscribe to anything to get access to them. It's just go on the internet and Google, uh, you know, Linda Rauschke YouTube or something. You'll see dozens of little things. Yep. You'll see Perfect. a common theme through most of them too. Yeah, great. Well, Linda, thanks again uh, for the time. Uh, for everybody watching, make sure to leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel.